Hey, what's good, fam? Welcome to another episode of the Feed Me, Fuel Me podcast. Durs and Jeff coming to you from beautiful Madison, Wisconsin, CrossFit Games 2018. And we've got the founder of Deuce Gym, Logan Gilbrick, with us. Just finished up the Hold the Standard Summit. That's right. Dude. Fresh fresh out. Like, yeah. not, not even 24 <laughs> yeah. hours done. I think I took a nap last night. <laughs> back into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, thanks for taking the time. Seriously, uh, dude. On, on, the, on the back end of such a, an awesome, awesome experience uh, yeah. to, to shed some light on everything that you have going on and yeah. your, your journey up to this point, man. So really appreciate you taking the yeah. time. Dude. And, and thanks for letting me steal some of your time, you yeah. know, and, and, and see you there at the thing. Yeah. yeah that's cool. Yeah. No, it was, it was really cool. Um, and I'll tell you what, what struck me to, to reach out to you in the first place. Um, I, I didn't have a whole lot of context about your journey up until, uh, the last couple of days, but you wrote an article about the difference between looking like you can perform and actually mm-hmm. being able to perform mm-hmm. okay. and the, the difference between those two aesthetics, yeah. right? The, the, the lie that the fitness industry has yeah. led the naive to believe, you know, and I thought that was just ex- extremely honest. So I, I, I dove into your profile a little bit more and saw a couple of the other things that you, uh, you've written and you really come from a place of, uh, honesty about the industry that we're in and uh so i want to dive into that perspective and how how you came along uh to uh just be authentic in that way about yeah. what what it is we do um, but for everybody who doesn't know who you are where you come from and how deuce came to be yeah. uh, uh just give us the cliff notes about your journey man yeah you know and i think giving the cliff notes might also answer your other question about maybe whatever it is that you felt when you read that article and some of the other articles, um, you know, uh, and I tend to say a lot of the same thing. So I want to sort of, uh, sort of be thorough here. Um, I, for the first part of my life from ages four until 24 or whatever, uh, roughly was, very specifically focused in the the sport of baseball was like my expression. It's what I wanted to do since the earliest memories I I had. And so uh, all of my decision-making and sort of actions and the way I showed up in my life were uh, setting me up as I thought to have the best chance to fulfill this sort of like dream. And, um, and that's a beautiful journey that, you know, it ended a decade earlier than I thought it would. Mm -hmm. Um, but it has informed a lot of who I am today, just like all of our, you know, journeys do, uh, along the way I was blessed to have incredible coaches. Like I always say, I felt like, you know, I remember coming through elementary school and looking back and be like, I had all the best teachers. Like us, you know, you got a couple third grade options and I'm like, I got the best one. And then fourth grade, <laughs> I got the best, you know, Mrs. Brown was like the best or whatever. And uh, that happened again for me uh, in athletics. You know, I had excellent coaches. I am not, and this sort of speaks to the question that you asked uh, with the authenticity part is like, I am a part of strength and conditioning uh, for reasons other than strength and conditioning. Mm-hmm. I need to hit baseball's further throw baseball's harder and play my sport better and so i can say with confidence that as a gym owner which i guess is one of the things that i am now uh and a coach i am in the position that i'm in with zero percent interest in fitness like as a pastime that's not like fun for me mm-hmm. i you know I always say, like, I never had any of the magazines. Like, I, I knew who Arnold was because he was an actor. I found out later that there was a bodybuilder. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I didn't enter this community through that route. And um, not only did I not enter through that route, uh, you know, the things that I am interested in are more of the things that you heard at the summit. Right. Right? Yeah. And so what happens here with my baseball career is um, – I end up signing at the University of San Diego and um, trying to like expedite this story. So at the University of San Diego, I end up having a bunch of great strength coaches. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, Shannon Turley, who's now Mm -hmm. uh, head at uh, Stanford, is our guy, you know. And if 
y'all know anything, if you're listening at home, if you know anything about uh, NCAA Division One athletics, uh, it's not guaranteed that you're going to have a high level strength and conditioning experience. One hundred percent. You're just not oh, yeah. like you know, and it's actually worse as you get into professional athletics. Often, I mean, football is very evolved because it's so physical that those best practices show up, but baseball is a very conservative skill-based thing right i mean right. how do we critique baseball it's boring as hell they're fat are they even really athletes <laughs> like well, let's be honest about this thing right because right. it's so skill dominant that right. maybe you don't need to be the fastest dude in the state to win baseball games sure mm-hmm. so that was i got lucky right mm-hmm. I, I shannon turley welcome to strength and conditioning man i mean he's ncaa strength coach of the year multiple times amazing Follow him up. He leaves with Harbaugh to go to Stanford, and we have Stefan Roche is our yeah. next guy. Early CrossFit flow master. So now I'm, like, whacked over the head with what this CrossFit thing is. Not because I care. Like, yeah. I'm not even trying to get a gym membership. I'm just trying to get drafted, you right. know. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, th- the summit was hosted at CrossFit Madtown. Skip and Keisha Benzing, right? Early CrossFit adopters. You know, Keisha's trying to go for her, her career in the 800, and Skip is a you know wonderful weightlifting coach. Their assistants, you know, assistant strength coaches there, right? Wow. And now you got Casey and Natalie Bergner are the other assistants, and so it's just like Fuck. there's this like this yeah. tee up to this thing, mm-hmm. and. I still don't care, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm going to put in the work because I'm trying to win a national championship with my boys, mm-hmm. right? And I get drafted in 2008 uh, by the San Diego Padres. I play two sort of reluctant seasons up and down in their system. Uh-huh. And all the while in the back of my head, this wasn't like plan B style, but I also value entrepreneurship. So I decide as I'm going through this thing to be the best in the world at the sport of baseball that – you know, if and when that thing finishes, I want to create businesses. Mm-hmm. The people who are most inspirational to me, that affected the most people, that made the most money, that um, were able to demonstrate their creativity in the world were entrepreneurs. So that's like my other interest. <clears throat> so I come out of professional baseball and I go back to Stefan with this like idea of solving this thing. This gets back to the article. Is... You start to recognize, if you're involved in high-level athletics, that you're having one conversation about, let's call it fitness, physical performance. And then if you spend any time looking at the world, you realize that there's this billion-dollar, multi-billion-dollar, I think it's like a $2 billion industry at this point, fitness in the United States, uh, that is slanging crazy shit (laughs) the infomercial thing the magazine thing and i'm just like if we're trying to be the best in the world at performance this is that and then what are you guys talking about over here this Mm. is crazy right and so that sort of informed the a message that i wanted to have for the world and i think entrepreneurship is a great environment to demand best practices just like sport uh, to say something in the world. And so that is sort of the birth of this fitness school that later became Deuce Gym and Deuce Athletics and Deuce Backlot and, and whatever. Um, however, I never cared about the pump, right? And so if it's, not, if it's not about the bigger thing, I'm not really interested in it. So we had to not just be a gym that's very conceptual and uh, interested in coaching, uh, I had a lot of other stuff to say, right? So now we have to have this blog and we have to have these opportunities to say that message. And now we're like an education company where we're, uh, you know, the summit's for me, man. Like this is for me to do my thing. The flavor just happens to be uh, fitness. Sure, sure, So that's the short kind of story. Okay, Yeah. all right. The the summit was, and I was was telling Kara this uh, the other day, uh, was unlike anything I've ever seen. And I, I say that uh, I would categorize myself as a, a seminar junkie. Okay. Right? Seen it all, done it all, right? You got all the letters yeah. behind your name. You yeah, got you know, any, any, all the yeah. Anything shy of Tony Robbins. Like, I, I've, you know, <laughs> okay. I've, I've seen that. You okay. know what I mean? And um, when you went through that exercise with Kara and uh, um, 
the the le- the the levels of consciousness that are associated with your limiting beliefs and the 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 shifting of the language mm-hmm. uh the the false negative mm-hmm. narrative that we tell ourselves and uh and and really framing that for yourself in real time so that people understand how powerful how powerful this exercise can actually be the um uh, the inherent vulner- vulnerability express and you know her being a, 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 a psychologist and uh, breaking the fourth wall with us mm-hmm. and explaining like oh did you see his body language and mm-hmm. you know watch him go through his process and blah 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 um, was just powerful beyond measure and I think that that's that's something that is uh, special to the the hold the stand standard seminar and i hope that you continue to to do that and express that um uh but when you go when you're going through this process and you're explaining all these things um it's you i'm just watching the the consciousness of the room just elevate in real time mm-hmm. yeah. so i want you know before we move forward with this conversation i want to make sure that i express uh immense gratitude to you for being allowing yourself to be that vulnerable mm-hmm. on your own platform that should never happen yeah. you know we're going to pull somebody out of the crowd mm-hmm. you're going to go through this process with somebody you have zero rapport mm-hmm. with and we're just going to hope that mm-hmm. you get what i tell you you're supposed mm-hmm. to get mm-hmm. out of the deal <coughs> so um how has your your process been with Kara? Mm-hmm. She kind of kind of dove into the background of how yeah. she had to create. Your interest in psychology was so deep, but as all of us that have been in NCAA athletics understand, mm-hmm. as athletes, we don't necessarily get the opportunity to take the classes we want to take if mm-hmm. they interfere with the sport that right. we're on. We're being paid to play, right. so to speak. Um, but she, you were so devout in your interest and so authentic in your expression of why you wanted to dive in deep that she created a work study program for you so uh that's not the right word work study but she uh, uh independent independent, independent study, study. Yeah, there yeah, you go. yeah 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 <laughs> um you're going old school out to yeah. old school all the way back yeah um yeah. and so your relationship goes back that far and now she's a coach she's your coach mm-hmm. um what have you found out about yourself, either proven or disproven, and I'm sure there's layers to this, um, that have enhanced your consciousness in the way that you operate as an, uh, an athlete and a business owner? Yeah. Um, first of all, th- thank you for, like, the, the kind words on the, the, the summit. You know, um, that vulnerability uh that you saw is maybe like noble or maybe that's like worth a, a golf clap or something like that. But, uh, you know, it's also self serving because unfortunately or fortunately I know the mechanics of development. That's what I was. I was the expert, right? A bunch of people paid a bunch of money to come listen to me be the expert. And guess what? If I'm the truthful expert, if what I'm saying about operating at your edge and exposing those blind spots and growing your capacity is true then guess what that means i'm not at the finish line so you're looking at a work in progress as well and i think it's very powerful uh it's it's a power move on purpose Mm -hmm. for me to be like welcome to the thing you guys saved up a bunch of money to come to this thing and you're gonna listen to the expert well guess what guess who's in the audience the person who's ahead of me (laughs) right and you're gonna see me get fucked up Mm -hmm. up here right right and i'm willing to do that so guess what what I'm saying is going to hit a little bit harder. Uh, Kara, uh, Dr. Kara Miller, I got you know she earned that. Dr. Kara Miller, uh, we met over ten years ago, uh, and I was a student at the University of San Diego playing baseball. And uh, the you know the important note to add here is that University of San Diego is a high level Division One baseball program. Mm. It's in this unique intersection, however, where you know my junior and senior year we are in conversation to win a national championship at a school though that isn't a big time sec school so we're sort of overachieving so you're in a place that like it's real school like you're talking to your professors like hey i gotta you know 
I'm going to try to uh, beat University of Texas this weekend so I can't make it on Friday. They're like, what? We have a baseball team? You know what I mean? are like, <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, it's this disparity, yeah. right? And so, mind you, this is also 2008, and it's the first year that NCAA added a uniform start date, okay? And so every uh, – uh, uh, every baseball program at the Division One level was going to start for the first time on the same weekend to sort of make for a more playing f- uh, field. Mm-hmm. In San Diego, we could play our first weekend in the end of January. So a bunch of cold weather schools had to play on the road for a long time, and this mm-hmm. is kind of unfair. So they pushed the, the start date back. Well, guess what? We still got to play 60 games this year. And so what it did is it made the, the schedule crazy. Like I remember March of my senior year, I – was on campus like a couple of days. You know what I mean? Like we're playing baseball, right? Jeez, at, a, yeah. at a school that is demanding some academic performance and they don't really care mm-hmm. what, yeah. what, is a, what is a national championship. For what, right? <laughs> okay, and so I was, a, I was an excellent student. Okay, so I wasn't there just getting C minuses and doing the thing. I was, a, I was an excellent student and, and I was going to do that thing. Well, University of San Diego, again, another great opportunity falls into my lap. Just so happens to be the second major university to build a leadership school. Wow. You know, I just so happened to get some extra credits because of my performance in high school to where I could perfectly fit without taking any extra schooling or coming in the summer or taking a fifth year to steal, as I call it, a leadership minor from the school. Wow. And that would fit in nice. I'm interested in that. I'm going to study business and leadership because that's what I am. I'm a catcher and I want to do some of this entrepreneurial stuff. Perfect. And so I'm doing this program and the last course in the leadership minor is called leadership seminar. And you have to do it last, right? And so here I am. I did all the things, checked all the boxes. And I'm about to finish my, my deal. And this course is going to meet at a time when we got games every time. Like I just can't come. And so I got this problem. So I, you know, I, I, I roll the dice and I just hope that the school will be empathetic. And I go to the, uh, to the leadership school and I, and I say, Hey, uh, you know, I play for the baseball team here. This is what I've done. I'm graduating. I would like to finish out your program, but there's this problem. My obligation to the university involves, I won't be able me not being able to be here at this one time. And they kind of, they weren't really into solving that problem for me. <laughs> they were kind of <laughs> like, oh, get it next semester. I'm like, I'm going to be playing professional baseball. I'm not coming back here to right. take one class. Like, can we work something out? Make it harder? Anything. No, 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 no. And I keep trying, I keep trying. And then one day I sort of, I knew the professor's name, doc, you know, Dr. Miller. Uh, and I'm just walking through the sort of offices and I, I noticed her desk, the little placard there, and she happened to be sitting there. So I sit down and I go, hey, I don't know if you're busy right now, but here's the deal. Tell her my story. Is there anything we can do? And all she tells me is, let me talk to some people and I'll get back to you. What's your contact info? That's all I hear. I didn't hear until eight years later what really happened. But she went back to the department and was like, if we didn't build this building for this type of person, I don't know why we're here help me have the freedom to make this work. And long story short, she went to bat for me and created an independent study, right? So I was able to take the course except for no place to hide one-on-one at the desk, right? And so, again, falls into my lap the greatest of opportunities for me to to grow and have a a great coach or or mentor. And um, our deal was, you know, she says, hey, I got good news. We can do this independent study. Bad news is going to cost you a california burrito every time you got to bring that thing with guacamole and, and so this was our <laughs> deal right and i took this course uh one-on-one with her and you learn at another level mm-hmm. when you're not in the back you're just not a number anymore <laughs> yeah. yeah and so y- yeah your boy did the reading right. type of thing you right, know right. and so uh that was a powerful connection man and you know her story is she she blows up, you know, PhD, uh, goes and teaches at Harvard, and then she's, you know, working with Bob Keegan, and she's in the all-star cast of adult development, right. positive psychology, leadership, organizational culture. You know, the joke I say, I'm her, like, biggest cheerleader, so the joke I say is, like, none of us can afford that conversation. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> whatever. So this is a bro deal for right, sure, right? Right, right. And uh, we stayed in touch and we're friends. And so I, I wanted to write this book and I proposed to her my idea. And she's like, yeah, that's great. I'll, I'll support you, you know, totally. 
and I left the conversation feeling good that I had a friend that I could bounce ideas off of. And then five minutes later was like, that's not going to do it. And I wrote her uh, an email back and I said, I need you to invoice me and I need it to hurt because I'm, I need to hire you for real to hold me accountable. And so our student, uh, teacher relationship that turned into a friendship turned into a business relationship. And, uh, she became my coach and the context was this book I was writing and you know, it's, it's a long arc, but I can see myself going through the sort of stages of consciousness that we talked about before, Mm -hmm. right? Like I am this athlete who identifies with an external subject matter expert, right? I, I believe in the idols that are the, the coaches and the authors and the thing. And then you sort of start to internalize that and you say, no, I have my thing to say. So I become the entrepreneur because I want to take my version of all these lessons I've learned and I'm going to say it. I'm in charge. I have my dogma now. And that's that level four self-authoring mm-hmm. thing, right? My Logan Gilbrick method to right. life. And she has pushed me to transcend that thing from this level four mm-hmm. to this level five thing where I can sort of stand above and see myself down there on the playing field thinking the little things mm. that I think, right, and see that I am uh, a system inside of a larger set of systems. And, right. uh, you know, she helps me see those blind spots. And it's edgy and hard, and it feels like the seminar, yeah. but in a personal type of way, mm-hmm. you know. That's crazy. Where's that humility and insight come for you to be able to you know, put yourself out there and hire mentors because, you know, a lot of the top people, I would say, thought leaders in the world, they all have coaches. But yeah. from the outside looking in, people think this is person's self-made. Yeah. And they don't see the back end of the people helping them. Like, where does that come from for you? Uh, you know, um, look, I think I'm, I'm blessed with um, – a thing, I, I don't know if it came from my parents or it, it was just something inside of me from other factors, but I've never doubted my ability to do something, uh, you know, uh, whether it's a professional athlete or be the president or be an astronaut. Like, I don't mm-hmm. have limiting beliefs in that way. However, the flip side of that same coin is I told people since I was five years old I was going to play professional baseball, and if they doubted me or made me give them another answer, I, I don't know what else to tell you this is what I'm gonna do kind of thing the other side of that like confidence is like I'm not athletic I I mean people laugh when I say that but like I'm I'm not right you know like I look different than I used to look but like uh I'm not like crazy gifted in that way and the only way I was gonna do it was just borderline kill myself working for it sure and so um that's just how I sort of like solve problems. Like I, I don't assume that any of this will be sort of easy. And so it's the only obvious step for me to assume that, uh, there's something or someone else out there that has something to offer me that I have to like work for my own adaptation. And that is a never ending sort of process. And so, uh, I have to be surrounded by people that are better than me because, Mm -hmm. The, this version of me won't work for wherever I want to go, mm-hmm. right. you know? And, uh, I think many people, uh, have the, let's say confidence or arrogance that help me say the other thing. Like I could be the president of this country. I really believe that. Right. That's like arrogant thing to say. Right. Yeah. Most people that would have that type of arrogance would assume that they just got it. And that's why a lot of people that say that don't do shit. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, so I think it, it's, uh, I, I want to sort of use both to, 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 to accomplish the things I want to accomplish. Mm-hmm. So, uh, she is a very important part of that and all the exposures that we seek out to challenge ourselves. Yeah. Sure. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, when, with regards to putting the, the summit together, I know that you say that's, that's for you, mm-hmm. but, uh, one of the things that you touch on is uh if we go through organizational structure was uh the the thing if it's going to be successful has to be bigger than you mm-hmm. right so 
in I feel like there's there's something behind that statement that it is for you, but it's b- bigger than you. Well, it things can be successful that are the size of you. Sure. Right. I'm the way I'm sort of looking at it is like I'm just gonna I'm gonna take a step back real quick and say that like me size success is this big and success uh, you know success that is larger than me is bigger. Right. And right. I'm willing to sort of like swallow that pill and say like you know. Uh, just in an objective view, mm-hmm. here's what's available if we can sort of transcend ourselves. And I'm interested in, in that thing. Yeah. Uh, the the catch-22 there is a lot of people actually use that, in my opinion, as a as, as an excuse uh, to limit the, their sort of upside, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like if, you will, if you'll never relinquish control, full control, this shows up all the time. This is what I literally coach people people in 99.9% of the time at the summit, right? What did I say? Most people come in here and they say, I'm the man or I'm the woman. And I got these people back here at my business that just don't get it. And their buy-in sucks. And if they were a little bit better at their thing, then we would be better. Well, guess what? They are the problem Mm. because they are unwilling to transcend their thing, right? Mm. And to relinquish, to give away power, right? And, uh, I don't believe in giving away power or creating something bigger than myself simply because I'm a giving guy. Mm-hmm. Right. It's not like this weird self-sacrifice thing. Mm-hmm. It's the utility of that is bigger. Right. Right. That there is mathematical advantageous power to that thing. Sure. Mm-hmm. And and that's that's why. Yeah. You know. There's a uh, another post that that came up uh, speaking about you know the 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 exponential advantage that comes with that that team building thing. Uh, some girl came in asking about a, a coaching job, and you told her about oh, yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> your your, your coach's development. I couldn't yeah. I couldn't believe it. I, it was it was so. It's the best commercial for the gym 100. in the history. Yes. Of commercials so yeah. she she's in her car on her way home from whatever the fuck transpired transpired <laughs> yeah. you know and uh she's like i went i i, I go in i want a coaching job and he tells me that i need to join the gym and then i have to go through this apprenticeship so you know I'm already spending two hundred and fifty dollars a month. It's gonna cost me money. I want money. Why do I have to spend money to get money? Right? All this. I just I was like and I'm I'm sitting there thinking to myself, people come into PHX Mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. They're like, Hey, do you have any do you have any coaching opportunities? I was like, I have plenty of coaching opportunities, but you have to go through this process Mm -hmm. first. Like, oh but you know, I have my degree in kinesiology. I'm like, Okay, that's cool. Well, I was just coaching at this other gym. I'm like, Okay, that's cool. Yeah, that's right. Um Well I was at regionals, I'm like, Okay, that's cool. You still gotta go through the process. That's right. And then I never see him again. Of course. Right. And uh, so I'm, I'm I'm listening to this this rant. And I mean, she just goes off, and I'm like, now we have to have him on the show. No, we're, that's we're, so we're awesome. like this. That's <laughs> so awesome. <laughs> I mean, there's so much there. Yeah. You know, like starting with, where's the camera at? <laughs> if you're a good coach. <laughs> you're not rare. Like you're not <laughs> cool. <laughs> Don't need you. You know what I mean? And if you're trying to do something special, if you're trying to create something remarkable, you know, the, the thing I end up saying all the time is like, you, you know, everybody wants a better team. Mm-hmm. Everybody wants that, that all-star cast. They want to do something remarkable. They want to win a championship. They want to, you know, uh, make a bunch of money or be successful in some way. Mm-hmm. Uh, Look at all those teams that do that thing. It's hard to get on those teams. There are rites of passage that make it to where, you know, like what's it like playing professional athletics? Oh, yeah, you got an opinion about you don't like how this goes? Hey, the 8 million people that are lined up out the door, next, like, (laughs) bye. Right. You know, and uh, there needs to be a certain level of of buy-in if we're going to – create uh, an environment that is incredible you know Mm -hmm. and uh cool you're fit and you're a good coach uh that's not enough at all Mm -hmm. to do this thing right right? right. and so that process is uh is wonderful i mean people watch that video i mean it's it's essentially like a rant this this woman comes in and and uh basically 
isn't getting a job instantly and she's mind blown at that and uh you know the reaction was of course you know 100 comments of people su- supporting the gym yeah. and uh the the irony is like that's half of the reason for the development program half of it is to get people better and develop their craft but the other half is like straight up filter yeah mm-hmm. oh yeah riffraff man you know uh, we talk about the summit and it's something that shows up all the time is everybody has these structures in place. They make, they put their prospective members through a process. You got to meet with me. You got to do this fundamentals thing. You got to pay this money. It's like, there's a rite of passage to be a member there, mm-hmm. but all your coaches, you just, they just were fit and emailed you <laughs> and then they're, they're in leadership now. And your mind is blown that like, they're not saluting the flag or they leave and open a, a gym somewhere because you also haven't created a place for them to make a living. Mm-hmm. And you're upset that mm-hmm. like it would be it would be a, co- a mere coincidence if someone became a leader at your gym through that channel. Hi, I'm fit. Can I work there? You say, yes, you're coaching tomorrow at 7 a.m. to simplify this person comes in. It would be such a coincidence if that person was like, I actually want to devote the rest of my life to you and build something outside of myself here. <laughs> like, like, why would that be the outcome? Right. So you're going to come to the summit and you're going to be like, these guys don't get it. Yeah. No, you don't get it. You haven't built a thing that gives an opportunity for anything other than those types of problems, mm-hmm. you know? So uh, the filter. Yeah, I mean... <sighs> You're not rare if you're a great coach. And, and, and there, I know people who have stood on the podium at the CrossFit Games who have expressed interest, and, and uh, it didn't work out for a number of reasons, but, like, they too would have had to go through that process. Mm-hmm. You know, one of my best friends in the world, Carl Pally, I think he's the best coach in, on earth. Mm-hmm. I believe that to be true. Mm-hmm. And there was a moment where he w- might have moved to L.A. and the whole thing and, and you know – we we're both excited for that, and the conversation on the phone is like, "How awkward is it going to be when you got to do coaches prep?" You know I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm not. You're doing it, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, the moment that standard doesn't mean anything, then the standard doesn't mean anything, mm-hmm. right? You know, right. I, I told a story the other day. Uh, uh, you know, my buddy is he became like this high-powered lawyer in Manhattan, right? And he's like, "Dude, I got to talk to you." I'm like, "What's up?" And he's like, "I saw this moment." like from my table at this fancy dinner last night that I don't think anybody kind of saw, and I just got to share it. I'm like, what do you got? They're at this Michelin star joint in, mm-hmm. in New York. Mm-hmm. Dress code, everybody needs a coat type of thing. Right. You know, 500 bucks a head type of joint. Yeah. And uh, he's sitting down working through his partner dinner, talking about saving the world or whatever they talk about, and uh, in comes this posse. And everybody is dressed to the nines and whatever, but there's like one guy where everybody kind of like, shifts and looks at the room and it's it's zuckerberg mark zuckerberg and and, and his crew right okay. and uh they come up to the maitre d and they're getting organized whatever and the maitre d does maitre d things which is like hold this sort of standard and he's essentially unbeknownst to the group going to get a sport coat for people who blow it on the dress code and he's gonna help out mr zuckerberg who is in his zuckerberg uniform right <laughs> he's in the hoodie with the white shirt and the jeans because you know, he's Doug Funny and does, he wears the same thing every day. That's right. his thing. <laughs> okay. And uh, <laughs> so the maitre d' is, like, going to hand him the coat and tell him to, like, abide, basically. And there's this beautiful moment where one of the sort of Facebook henchmen, posse guys, <laughs> feels like he's doing a favor to the maitre d' and intercepts this conversation. Like right in front of Mike Mark's talking to somebody and the maitre d's coming up with the jacket and he sort of sees what's happening and he goes, uh, he extends the coat out and the guy like intercepts and he goes, oh, I'm sorry. That's, that's Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> and the maitre d' goes like around his shoulder and he goes, this is New York. <laughs> and no. held the hell out of that standard <laughs> yeah. take your stupid hoodie off second richest person in the world and play the game right, right? right. and uh, if you're gonna be the hoity toity uh, Michelin star restaurant sometimes then are you that right right, right. right. <clears throat> if Mark Zuckerberg's over there in like a hoodie and like 
you know, shell toes. Like, what is this place? Mm-hmm. Right? And, sure. And, and that matters. Right. And we have those standards, and they're not the right standards. I mean, we're all making this up. We're yeah. drawing lines and borders <laughs> where we think they go. Mm-hmm. But if you want to play our game, you play our game. Right. You know? And there, there's a, an advantage to that. Yeah. Sure. You know? That's crazy. Yeah. You know what? One thing. <laughs> that's a wild story, man. That's <laughs> right. Great. Doug, Doug Funny. <laughs> Dude, Doug, <laughs> I really like the Doug Funny reference. <laughs> I love that show. <laughs> I really do love that show. We all. You know? <laughs> yeah. Man. You've, at the similar, one thing that really struck me, you talked about living at the edge. Yeah. Could you dive deeper into, like, what that means to you and an example of sort of living at that edge? Because you know, you, we understand the term in our space of what that means. Mm-hmm. But for, like the majority of people i think it's a hard concept to understand completely on how to finally like how to actually live at that edge could you yeah dive into that a little bit more well it's hard and it's hard too because you start saying words like consciousness and people are like bro like put the beads away like what are we doing yeah. out here? <laughs> guys hey, got yeah. long hair he's from oh venice you know what i mean like, <laughs> put the fingers yeah, together yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, where are we at self-conscious yeah. 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 my hands yeah. in my yeah. pockets <laughs> so it's kind of hard to talk about it's also it feels like we don't know what that is it it gets heady Mm -hmm. and you know sometimes especially us gym folks we're like i'm out dude yeah yeah Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but the way i like to talk about it is um at least most of the people that want to listen to what i say know how to do that Mm -hmm. with physicality Mm -hmm. you know like what did we talk about uh this this weekend in the uh summit is what are we doing in the gym we are driving adaptation and how does that process work in a in a in an organism? Well, there needs to be some sort of stress that is going to support this adaptation to mm. give reason to to change and evolve. And you know the example I gave at the summit was you know you got a 500 pound back squat PR and you want to grow that capacity, you need to operate at a level of stress that would elicit a response to sort of move the needle on that capacity Mm -hmm. and there's no rep scheme or like amount of like weird bands or like you know online program that you could do with a 135 pound barbell to move the needle it's not stressful enough well we know how to grow muscles and grow uh you know uh central nervous system to express power and do physical feats with this type of thing but our self our this is why i use the c word consciousness right what you're we're capable of holding the perspectives that we're capable of holding operates in a similar type of way mm. and unfortunately it too is uncomfortable right like mm-hmm. you put five more pounds on the bar than you did last week and last week was hard we're starting to get stressed man like that's the the, the mechanics behind the thing well what does that look like when it's not physical and it's in between your ears. Well, there's a, a number of different ways that this can happen, but what I sort of distill that down to is that 135 pound barbell example is sort of like confirming information. We own that. Mm-hmm. You get under the bar, I know how this goes, therefore it's not stressful by definition. Mm-hmm. Well, disconfirming information, things that challenge my beliefs, what I hold to be true. If I'm shown that, like right in my face, I believe X. And he's just looking right at something in your face that says that's not true. And you can't duck it and get around it. This is disconfirming information. And it comes in lots of different forms. External events can happen in your life. You can get negative feedback from people. Anything that challenges your frame has a chance to break it and, and grow it. And so people who are driving adaptation sort of between the ears are on the hunt for this type of disconfirming information. Mm-hmm. It's sort of outside of our scope. Mm-hmm. And, you know, depending on who you're studying or through, wit, through which model you are looking at this type of adaptation, you will call these stages different things and that maybe some have colors and you just pick borders in different places and, and all that. But the concept is generally the same that we evolve through these sort of stages. And the problem with that is this, the world is growing in complexity every single day, every single year, every single era. And many of us are, to use 
Bob Keegan's words, uh, in over our heads, meaning the complexity of the world is greater than our ability to hold that complexity. And the, the challenges of our world, solving them is going to require greater complexity, more capable minds to do that. And we're in a place right now where we're sort of behind. And if we want to be the leaders that we want to be, if we want to solve the type of adaptive challenges that we want to solve, you know, borderless war, uh, you know, um, global warming, like the ethics of uh, artificial intelligence, that's another one. Like, you don't, can't Google those answers. Mm -hmm. you, there, th there's no manual for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so either we grow the capacity to manage this or <laughs> this is our new evolution yeah. we go away right yeah. right and so i don't want to get like too crazy but like that those are sort of some of the benefits and consequences of our ability to hold this space or not and uh, we have the ability to do this and i'm interested in what i'm capable of sure you know yeah you know what at the conference there was uh there's an interesting question that was proposed okay when you opened the floor up before lunch yesterday okay. and the woman, she brought up the idea of social media is such a huge distraction. It's one of the most negative things out there. Oh yeah. And then you flipped the framing on it. You said, okay, I can tell you already have a negative view of this thing we call social media. But what if that negative idea changed to, it could be the most positive thing you made in the world. You put your message out there that impact hundreds of thousands or millions of people. And I just thought that, change and framing was incredible because you hear a lot of people how you challenged her idea you don't hear a lot of people challenge that yeah in the face they may go behind closed doors and yeah. say well i didn't agree with that yeah but you hit her direct in the mouth with it yeah. and i thought that was so incredible because you just saw that shift in her and she just thought like wow yeah. he uncovered a layer in me to where my thought process was broken essentially or you know i at least challenged my idea to make me think of a different outcome I just thought that was just beautiful how you challenged her in that respect because you could just tell it, it made the it made the clock tick again, you know? That I mean that that's sort of what the summit if I was gonna like dumb down the summit like to ground zero, it's me making disconfirming information sexy. Yeah. And I'm there to give it and I'm there to convince the people in the room that they should be out looking for it. And so uh what is social media? Is it the biggest time waste in the history of the world? Like there's a great uh, book out there on one hand that is saying uh, it's called the dumbest generation. We have more opportunity, more information available to us in the history of the world. And we are dumber than we've ever been in a lot of ways. What do we have to show for it? Right. There is uh, uh, the man hours spent playing uh, Halo uh, is an exponential of the man hours it takes to build the the Great Pyramids. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, we are blowing it. <laughs> like, can we harness this type of manpower to do anything right. at all, right? right? On one hand. Yeah. Oh, like, so is Instagram and social media cat videos and fail uh, blogs or whatever? Or is the hyperlink the greatest opportunity in the history of humankind mm -hmm for connection and to solve problems that were impossible before. Like the fact that we can link exponentially all of these people together across borders that like would never speak before right. is an opportunity that, I mean, let's look, we don't have to look far for examples. This conversation. We are here yeah. right. because of that thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, like, right. so what is it? And to me, like <coughs> what I was doing was giving her some disconfirming information, what yeah. she believed to be true. Right. And she expressed this was that my brand is not superficial. We are about connection, human connection, the good kind. <laughs> Instagram is superficial. Mm. That's not my type of connection. And what I said is, you believe that to be true? What about this? Can you hold both of those? And this is a certain level of conscious development when you can hold two opposing truths to be true at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very few people can do that. And this is not even the hardest one. There's right. more levels beyond this, but is social media the worst thing of all time and it's cat videos and fail blogs and we're blowing it? And is it also the greatest opportunity for human connection of all time? Right. Yes. Not right. or, either or. 
Sure. Yeah, yes. Sure, sure, sure. Yes. Yep. Can you hold both of those? And uh, yeah, that is a, a harder approach. Mm-hmm. That's the catch twenty two of this. Right. You know, responsibility is hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Damn truth on that. One of the uh, the the other concepts that you really drove home was the concept of anti anti fragility, mm-hmm. being anti fragile. Um, and, uh, um, one of the things, one of the defining criteria of a genuine relationship is, you know, be- between two human beings is, you know, how anti-fragile is it? Your ability to have those uncomfortable yet honest conversations that, uh, hold people, hold, hold the standard, no pun intended, mm-hmm. uh, hold people accountable, um, and at the same time, you're able to have those discussions with discom- about disconfirming beliefs. Uh, and, but at the same time, through that, that potential conflict come out on the other side, maybe not necessarily, dis- not, maybe not necessarily agreeing, but an understanding of either one of your point of view, a deeper understanding of the other side's point of view. Um, Give us some examples of how, uh, within your organization, maybe even your personal life, that anti-fragile uh, persona manifests. So, how that works at the sort of highest level, this the opportunity for an anti-fragile relationship, we'll say, uh, requires some basic things, and we talked about them this weekend. One is like a willingness. So, if we're going to sit down at a table you and I, and we're going to try to accomplish something and I am unwilling to participate. You can be as, you can be, you can have enough willingness for the whole city, (laughs) but if I'm unwilling, then this doesn't work. Right. Straight up. The other thing is because this is edgy and uncomfortable and we're going to be open to, we're saying this disconfirming information, there needs to be a certain level of trust that I can honestly divulge information that might feel uncomfortable for me to give and uncomfortable for you to receive. If I don't feel safe in giving that information, then I'm, I'm not going to give you the real shit. Mm-hmm. Okay, So we need to have these two things. The glue, the, the good news with this, because this is hard. Everybody around the room the other day was like, I like what you're saying, but hard. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how bad I want that. Right? Okay. Right. The glue that makes this thing work and it's the reason why it shows up in the best teams in the world is higher purpose, okay? If we don't really care about the conversation, the nature of the thing, or we're not on, like, the same team or whatever's going on, there's no aligned higher purpose, it's not really worth it all the time because mm-hmm. negative, inf- uh, negative feedback doesn't feel good, mm-hmm. right? Right? It's, it's the reason why we don't just have these conversations with anybody, Right? But who does? People that win Super Bowls do. People that win wars do. Pe- people that accomplish amazing things do. And the reason why we can sort of justify having these harder conversations is because we just so happen to be trying to do something incredible. Maybe that's entrepreneurial, mm-hmm. right? So in, in our organization, Deuce, the, the brand Deuce is, is trying to accomplish something incredible. Because of this sort of lengthy rite of passage, um, Everyone that's involved wants to be there more than any place on the planet. Mm -hmm. There's no, like, fake-ass rappers there, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody is about it. Right. Everybody's got the the neck tattoo, right? Everybody's (laughs) saluting the flag. And if we start there and we say, hey, we're trying to do something hard, Mm -hmm. but I'm not here for a paycheck. I'm here for something bigger than myself. Then it's pretty easy to get around to the idea of, like, do you agree that if I – feel open and compelled to speak the truth to you that we could be a better team you'd be like yeah i agree with that and if you said that to me i would agree with that as well we have a we're pulling from the same end of the rope there Mm -hmm. and that provides this open lane for me to hear and for me to say what needs to be heard and what needs to be said right and the examples we gave the, the summit right is like the office space mentality. You work at the job that doesn't matter in the cubicle that's stupid from nine to five because mm-hmm. fucking you don't even know why you're doing that. 
what is the conversation like at the water cooler? I wouldn't even know because I've never had one of these jobs, but I've seen movies and I hear people bitch about it is about some bullshit. Mm -hmm. John, the weather, huh? Looking good out there. And it, like we're just faking everything. Mm -hmm. And you go to work doing two jobs. You try to do your job and stay out of trouble and you try to cover your ass. That's what those people are doing. Right. We're flipping that on its script. We're going to our job to do our thing, to do our job and to to shine a light so bright on our weaknesses because we all got them. Like, let's, mm -hmm. let's not lie about this. You disagreed and I disagreed that if you can help me improve, then we both win. So what's that conversation like? It's no longer the, you know, what's the example I gave this weekend? It's like, hey, Susan, uh, love the dress. Love that dress. Uh, anyway, uh, in the email report, you forgot to put, the subject line, the right way that we do. If you could just include that, that would be great. And then, you know what? I can't wait to see you at the party. It's great to see you. And it's this, this compliment, critique, compliment bullshit, mm -hmm. right? Do the Oakland Raiders talk to each other like that, right? The SEAL Team 3 talk to each other like that? No, they're interested in the truth. It's, that's too slow and inefficient, mm -hmm. right? And um, luckily for us and people in a very passionate, you know, high-purpose space, it's a little easier for us to create an organization like that. Right. Mm -hmm. I worry about how CVS is going to do that. That's my example all the time. Sure, right? sure, I, sure. I worry about how P.F. Chang's is ever going to get there. Because guess what? No offense or whatever. I'm just using examples. But like, if you're the waiter there, maybe you don't give a shit about P.F. Chang's. You probably don't give a shit. If you're the manager, you also don't give a shit. If you own the franchise, like you kind of just picked a franchise, maybe like you didn't grow up wanting to be that wasn't even a thing. Right. right and right. so we can look at the, the tales or the mm -hmm. rare events of organizations and people who are dry, trying to do incredible things. They're willing to do some things that are hard. Yeah. Right. And and it it's sort of like the lubricant for yeah. this type of conversation. Well, I think on the, the other side of that is something that you also touched on at, at the summit. And that was, uh, and I apologize if I misquote you, but, uh, I'm not trying to be right. I'm trying to find the truth. And I think that's kind of ties all that up and puts a bow on it. Um, when you operate in that context, it's no longer about being, superior or being the smartest guy in the room it's it's trying to find an environment or a reason to not be those things mm -hmm. and un, you'll act accordingly uh, until proven otherwise yeah but while you're acting accordingly you're trying to find reasons or situations where your philosophy your methodology your system yeah. doesn't work this is our philosophy so far Right. right. Yes. And and and, and <clears throat> you know the it, to me like to use a sports example is like are you on offense or are you on defense? Mm -hmm. And the moment that you are interested in being right, you are uninterested in disconfirming information. You're <laughs> you're looking for things that support your your code, your method, your thing. Mm -hmm. And if you're humble enough or willing enough or courageous enough to find out What's the developmental question? How I might be wrong about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then that's that's a key to the city for development until forever. Yeah. Right? You are on offense. You are willing to take in both positive and negative feedback about your thing because truth is your guide rather than being right mm -hmm. as your guide. Yeah. And there's a lot of people, and this is that stage four thing, right, where you're like, I used to have these idols and these socialized sort of belief structures and constructs and then I take those and I emerge and I'm the self-authoring captain of my vessel it's the Logan method <laughs> right and in order to preserve the Logan method I need to put blinders on to information that is not supporting my clause right this is right. the joke about like Facebook like what are you reposting you know what I mean <laughs> you, you're reposting the shit that makes your shit look good right <laughs> if you catch that article that's like maybe your way isn't the best you're like absolutely not that of <laughs> course is not relevant right, right? and so uh, the insurance against this type of stagnation is that question how might I be wrong about this and mm -hmm. so it really pays to try to break your game yeah. 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 You know, and a lot of things that I come from a tech background, software yeah. development. Okay. And a lot of the methodologies 
in tech sort of resemble what you were speaking about, about having an open feedback loop mm -hmm. where you're getting people just, dis, what does he call it? Um, disconfirming, disconfirming information. information. Yeah. So there's a methodology that works with the best companies in the world. So you imagine Facebook, Google, mm -hmm. it's called the agile methodology. Okay. So every week during a software development phase, mm -hmm. you have groups that are having deliverables throughout that. Yeah. At the end of the week, all those groups come together, touch base, put their deliverable out there, and then you have this information coming, you know, this isn't the best way to help this project move forward, but this is great. Feedback. Let's, feedback. Yeah. let's put this information together and let's move in the right direction. Yeah. But it's an every week touch point. And then another one that doesn't work really well is called the waterfall methodology. Kay. You do this long development phase. It may take six months or whatever to create this deliverable. Mm -hmm. At the end of that six month period, you come and say, this is what we have. And a lot of those projects fail because it was such a long period of touch point. Yeah, the feedback loop. The feedback loop was broken through that entire process. Yeah. And when you were just talking about how can you create an organization where people are open to giving you that honest feedback on a regular basis, those are the metho methodologies that came ringing back to me. And Durs and I were having the conversation as we were doing that exercise of, yeah. you know, how can people in your organization come to you and feel comfortable giving you this tough information, but also this helpful information? Totally. And I just thought that was just a beautiful thing because yeah. when you take concepts from, you know, whether it's fitness or software, it's all the same application in everything that you do in life. Totally. And it just makes you start deconstructing yourself. And I just thought you did it in such a beautiful way that it just resonated on so many levels with me. Yeah. So I just... Well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, that, that feedback loop, we see, you know, examples of that e everywhere. Like the formal academic one that I just, I'm beating a dead horse on is yeah. deliberate practice, yeah. right? And that's just uh, mechanics for tightening the feedback loop on skill uptake right you know and the example i gave yesterday is uh you know uh someone who is inside of deliberate practice on uh you know playing the violin would be uh receiving immediate informative feedback about their deviations from standards so you play the first note and the note that you see on the page is not what you heard that is a feedback loop that is extremely tight that's one way to practice the violin it's a very high powered way to learn to play the violin now if i play the entire song and i get to the end and i say like how did that sound that's the waterfall method the feedback loop is too long you're getting better it takes you a whole song to get one piece of information versus 200 bits of feedback mm -hmm. as you go mm -hmm. right and uh you know the baseball example right and so how do we know all this stuff, right? It's best practices. Yeah. This is all right. this is, right? Mm -hmm. And it just so happens when, uh, you know, 20 million American kids want to play baseball more than they want to do anything, you start to find out how to do it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing, like weightlifting is the best example I can think of in like in our world, which is like, there's not many rules. The rules have changed a little bit over the years, but essentially it's like bar starts on the ground, bar gets overhead. I'll let you stop at the shoulder. I'll call it the clean and jerk. Yeah. Have at it. There's a reason <laughs> why people in China look like the people in Canada who look like the people in the US who look like the people in Iran because they're just hunting best practices. Right. What we see in those points of performance are not the rules, right? It's just the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the baseball example is uh, it's such a high skill game that common language since I was like, you know, 10 is making adjustments pitch to pitch. Mm. Like what's the tightest loop that you can find improvement. If it takes you a game to make an adjustment at the plate, maybe that's pretty good as like a intermediate or whatever. If it takes you a season to make an adjustment, like that doesn't really serve us, mm -hmm. right? I always swing at curveballs in the dirt. Next season, I'm gonna not swing at curveballs <laughs> in the dirt. Bro, there's some kids who are getting better from inning to inning. You're out. Mm -hmm. That skill development is too slow. Right. The best in the world, Big league hitters who are making $12 million a year are internalizing and making adjustments from pitch to pitch. That game is dissected down. You know, for the fans, it's nine innings long. For every single person on the field, it is a pitch reset. And everybody has their, their reset thing. There's a great article on um, Ichiro Suzuki playing right field for, you know, you know future Hall of Famer for uh, the Mariners. And the the writer of the article was about to like bash this dude. Like we got this hall of famer at the end of his career. Who's just dazing off in the outfield. You know, he's checked out Now, obviously he's on his way out. I'd be surprised if he plays two more years because what he was observing is between each pitch, everybody has a pre pitch routine. It's right, left step, 
right? And he has a, an approach, what he's trying to do. If the ball's hit to him, where does he go? If it's to his right, where does the ball, where does he throw the ball? If it's to his left, where does he throw the ball? But after each pitch, you know, baseball's boring as hell and nothing ever happens, right? <laughs> the ball doesn't get hit to him. He's looking up in the stands. And the next pitch, right, left step, looking up in the stands. And so this, this author of this article is like, this dude is not even checked in. This is, he's, he's done. This is sad or whatever. Goes to interview him about it, tries to call him out on this thing. And he says, actually, this is a deal I've made with my sports psychologist, and there's a, there's a, a point in the stadium. It's actually that stairwell up there. I don't know if you can see it right there, but the fourth rung on the stairwell is my reset point, and it allows me to come back to the moment and prevents me from dwelling on the past or thinking about the future. He was a mental master, right? He's not dazing off. He was coming back to the pitch because for him, it's not about this inning or this game. That is way too slow. If you're going to be a Hall of Famer, you have to play that game one pitch at a time. Right. And if he's going to come to that pitch as the highest performing version of Ichiro Suzuki, he needs to leave every other pitch behind. You know? So I had a point in the stadium that was like that. Some players have rubber bands. They do the old rubber band mm-hmm. come back to center trick or they have a yeah. focal point on their glove or whatever. Right. And, and what the hell does baseball have to do with weightlifting or designing software or whatever, right? These are the universal principles that are living above the details of whatever our interests are, mm-hmm. right. right? This is skill development. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the moment is uh, uh, where we all live. So mm-hmm. whoever's mastering that moment better will tend to uh, have the best chance for success. Sure. That. sure. That's man. Yeah. Where you're st- sitting currently in your life, how would you define your life's purpose at this moment? Man, that's such a, that's such a heavy thing. Um, I'm highly interested in finding out what I'm capable of. I'm highly interested in, in truth and, and, and what my truth is. And to be honest, it's, it's ever changing. I'm, uh, I am holding myself and have held myself to the responsibility of not being the same person next year than I am this year, you know? And so, to more specifically answer your question, what that looks like is my arc is, you know, I, I try to get good at coaching. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm a good coach, right? Maybe I, I reached a certain level of, of expertise in that, that thing, and that's not a, a journey that's over. There's no finish line there. Of mm-hmm. course, we can go forever. But uh, I wanted to put myself in an environment to challenge that capacity, right? And so what does that look like? Well, not only am I, uh, let's say, like, some sort of expert level coach in my little slice of fitness life, but could I coach the craft of coaching to another coach? Mm -hmm. Could I coach the craft of coaching to another coach at a level that he or she could coach other coaches, right? And that's Mm -hmm. coaches prep, right? And then coaches prep became coaches prep 101 online, right? Where now we're, we're coaching other coaches at other facilities, removing the, the autopilot filter, driving evolution in that way. And then, uh, to transcend and include that capacity. Now we're talking about the, the summit and talking about leadership, right? And, and, uh, what is that and how do I develop that and cultivate that type of adaptation, right? Mm -hmm. Moving from technical leadership, meaning like, here's how you pick up an Atlas stone. This is information, right? You signed up to get the information. You leave with the information. Mm -hmm. That's one type of leadership. Well, the leadership I'm interested in is adaptive leadership meaning I need to evolve people less about information and more about them going from who they are now to being a bigger, more capable container into the future. And in order to hold that type of space, I need to be of a certain capability, right? My container needs to be even bigger. And so, uh, I'm trying to sort of transcend, uh, fitness a little bit, right? Fitness was like the excuse for the business, but now that that is becoming more general, right? Mm-hmm. Hold the Standard Summit started in Spain, and it was like seven people sitting down being like, all right, so how do you do it? What are the memberships? All right, well, what's the website look like? How often do you write the blog? Is there a picture at the top or is it at the bottom, right? It's all mm-hmm. technical bullshit. Mm-hmm. It doesn't fucking matter, Yeah. <laughs> right? What is it now? If you are in any leadership capacity of any kind, of an organiza- with an organization of any kind, I'm going to talk to you about some principles that have 
nothing to do with fitness or everything to do with fitness mm. right and uh i am wanting to see what is is there and so um you know i wrote this this book that we're editing right now and and uh, i'm just trying to to evolve and, and push my myself forward and that looks like um i think departing the specific technicalities of of fitness mm. Mm. So before we let you get out of here, man, uh, I want to ask you two questions, and you can answer them on, on any level, uh, mental, physical, spiritual, whatever, however it strikes you. Uh, the, the fr- and I'll ask them both. Uh, the first of which is uh, each and every day, how do you feed yourself and create the momentum to do what you do and have the impact that you have and the follow on to that is what do you do each and every day to fuel yourself and make that momentum sustainable over the long term man this is uh at the heart of really what i'm what i'm looking at right now i mean like full transparency and i don't say this to like get attention or like pity or something like that but uh you know uh, for the first time in my life i sort of reached like a dark period like a year and a half ish ago where, you know, looking backwards, I'm sort of realizing that like people use like the, you know, the D word like depression and, and, and mental health is like, these are all sort of buzzwords right now. But, uh, yeah, I've, I've found myself in a place that is unrecognizable to me. And it really comes down to ultimately in my case, at least, um, finding the answers to the questions that you're talking about right now. Uh, we all have strengths, and I think what we don't recognize sometimes is the, the, the biggest strengths, the one, the pillars that stand up the highest have a, a shadow. And that shadow comes with some stuff. And mm-hmm. if you don't pretend, or sorry, if you pretend that that's not there, then you can kind of get yourself into trouble. Mm-hmm. So remember my story. What was my story? I'm an unathletic dude trying to do something hard that's athletic, right? I got to work really hard and I got to endure and I got to blue collar the hell out of it. I got to put in more reps than the other guy. I can endure and take on this, this crap. That's how I win. Cool. Really, that's a strength of mine, I would say. Right, it's the reason why I'm successful in business and, and other things. Um, well, the shadow of that is if that's my default, then I put myself in situations where uh, you start putting rocks in your bag, and then the bag's getting heavy, and it's okay because it's heavy, because heavy's good, and I got this, and I can endu- I can keep going, I can keep going, like until you can't, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and if you don't know how to fuel yourself, you get yourself into a position like I did where where I'm sort of looking around and I built guilty party here I built a lot of the relationships in my life to be a one-way sort of street because if we're in relationship together and business or something and maybe you can't get something done I got this because I can endure it that's what I do it's fine and then I do that over and over again and then I just start to resent you actually Mm-hmm. And I got more work to do. Mm-hmm. And then I, I do that around my life to the point where you get into this thing and maybe you run out of energy. And that was the only thing that let, that allowed it to go. Right. That's the only way that allowed you to carry all the rocks. Um, I don't have the skills to answer your question. I don't have the skills to nurture myself. What is that? Mm-hmm. Right. Because I, I was willing to give that up. I was willing to, to sacrifice that to win. Sure. Right. That was my strength. Right. And so, um, right now I'm, I'm in it uh, straight. I'm uh, in it. Like Damn. I'm team therapy right yeah. now, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and it's, it's hard work. Um, and so it's, you know, restructuring these relationships, being able to communicate. There's no pride really mm-hmm. in doing that enduring thing. I need to be able to articulate to you what I need from you. Sure. Right. I'm not in service to you. We are in maybe service to each other. Mm -hmm. And so um, I am like in kindergarten for that Mm -hmm. right now, you know. And so, um, you know, I'm I'm working on it and coming through it and all that. And uh, specifically what's changing is sort of I'm not really um, coaching fitness right now. I'm sort of 
gravitating to the things that, that feel good for me. I'm, I'm writing more and developing some of the educational stuff, doing the summit and all that. Um, and I need to, to re-enter and engage in things that are also feeling for me. Sure. And so, uh, I'm, I'm in preschool, maybe kindergarten on how to n- nurture myself. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Okay. Yeah. That's beautiful, man. And yeah. authentic. Dude, yeah. I applaud you on that, man. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. Where can everybody in this community go follow you and support you? on your journey both professionally and personally so uh yeah man on the internet on the thing with all the, the field blogs and cat videos <laughs> right? <laughs> the, the destruction of humankind that's where you can find me um uh so on like twitter and instagram at functional coach is my thing yeah. I'm, um active on there i communicate with people and messages and and you can get a feel for maybe what i'm talking about uh every day uh there's a blog at deucegym.com that uh is not about bar cycling or knees out or some other shit you already know about you know what i mean it's about stuff that uh you might find interesting you know two minute reads uh and the 2000th blog article will come up in a couple months you know that's been monday through friday every week for seven years uh and i take a lot of pride in that so so maybe uh mix that make reading sexy again (laughs) um and the last thing i'll say is uh the educational thing. So coaches prep one-on-one that people from all over the world are sort of removing that autopilot thing. I know all you guys are coaching 7:30 AM class staying exactly the same as you were last week. <laughs> you know, uh, you're not getting better. Uh, coaches prep is a way to, to bring deliberate practice to the craft of coaching. Uh, that's where you can find information about the summit, okay. you know, just coming around in the world. And then uh, business prep one-on-one will be uh, coming out shortly here dope so, and when your yeah. book drops let's let us know man we'd yeah, be more than man. happy to support you on that maybe that's why i'm depressed that thing don't ever <laughs> write a book uh don't ever do it i feel you yeah dude, dude oh yeah. man uh, i'm on number two are you yeah Fuck. dude respect uh <laughs> that is the most important thing i've ever done in my life and i'm excited for when it comes out yeah. except for uh i've told people for the last two christmases at least that it would be under their tree for christmas so uh <laughs> it's getting really close um yeah it's in the ed- final editing process and and it's f- it feels good i'm excited for that oh, well, brother. Yeah. one last question yeah when do you want to bring the summit to phoenix oh snap let's do it i got you bro do you yeah. okay oh, cool yeah. i'm yeah. into it we'll uh it. yeah we're we're doing dates for uh for 2019 right now we got uh new york sydney uh a, a spot in new zealand and um, coming back to Venice, so uh, we got we got sp- space. Okay. Next year. Yeah, yeah. we'll Dope. do it. I'd like yeah. that. Yeah, cool. for sure, man. Um, for everybody out there in Feed Me, Fuel Me land, uh, make sure you get out there and and support everything that Logan and Deuce are are up to. Uh, we'll keep you up to date on everything that he has going on. Hopefully, that that book will come out sooner sooner than later. Um, and uh, dude appreciate everything uh, everything really. that you bring to the table uh your your message is uh, as authentic as it gets and i think that your your reach is greater than what you than your current vision will mm-hmm. allow you to see thank you um, but from the outside looking in man you got a good thing going on you keep putting that good out in the universe man thank you i appreciate yeah. you guys this, yeah. has been, this has been fun thank you for sure yeah. uh and until next time guys feed me fuel me <laughs>